This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. So, so those of you who are in the session, please feel free to, um, you know, correct me if I got some of it wrong or add whatever I forgot to say, which is important. So, um, the, the text that we were looking at was um, Nancy Houston's uh, in French in the original. Um, and so a Canadian, a Canadian, a Canadian, somebody, uh, a Canadian woman, if you like, although that's questionable as, as the text goes on, who, um, who write, writes in, in, in French. And um, the first, the first important thing um, to be said about, about the writer was that she she sees being a writer and, as, and, and being a mother as two, um, two roles that are in a sense, to some degree, incompatible because she says that to be a writer um, you have to suspend moral judgment and you have to, and you, you have to be free to, to be unethical, if you like, whereas motherhood for her is an ethical, uh, an ethical um, project, if you like. Um, also, uh, th her idea that to be a novelist you are, you are selfish, you're, you're writing, whereas for, to be motherhood is a selfless, a selfless role that you take on. This is something that was then questioned further on, and I'll come to that as I go along, because I'm just going to read through the notes, really. Um, the, fact that, the, fact that she, that the fact that she chose, um, well, no, maybe I should begin, because I don't know if you've all read the text. But presuming that you have, because we were all given it, I'm not going to try and summarise the content. But an important thing to say would be that you know she begins the text with her apologies, if you like, for it not being forced exile. You know, this is a kind of voluntary exile. But um, and I'll come and yeah, I suppose I could say it now. But but in the group we, we then started to discuss, you know, what is the difference between voluntary and forced exile? And okay, so we have all these external examples of why it's not a forced exile, but then maybe there were internal reasons which then come through the text, uh, personal reasons which would which forced her, if you like, to to, to leave um, to leave her to leave Canada and to leave her, her mother tongue. So the fact that she writes in French, we felt answered question number five, how do these mothers get their voices heard? So she goes to live in, in France, makes her voice heard by writing in French, also by raising children in French um, as a non-French woman. Uh, so she then has this sort of ambiguous identity, she's a French writer, but is she a French woman, so I think, if I understood correctly, she considers herself to be a French woman as well, but outsiders do not see her They see as a French woman, they see her as a Canadian woman who writes in French. And so she's asking, um, you know, how is it possible to have this division? Um, so this made us talk about the, the distinction between one's external, external categorizations or perceptions of oneself and internal categorizations and perceptions. Um, the fact that she's also raising her children in French um, was also was also seen um, as a way of learning the culture by proxy, if you like. So, uh, uh, learning, acquiring childhood, French childhood culture through the children, um, and then the fact the fact that she. Um, it was also pointed out that neither, neither her nor her partner nor the father of her children are actually French. But French was, in a sense, he's Bulgarian, I think, so that French was, in fact, a, a common language, if you like, a common, a common um, denominator for the family. Um, and I think... Or, so, so, in a sense, there's, there's this tension in the text of how she makes this conscious decision about what language to bring up her children, you know, what, what language to bring her children up in. And, and someone pointing out that she doesn't really emphasize the fact that she's multilingual or she doesn't tend to celebrate the idea of multi, mu being multilingual. It's really the French. So, it's a really a turning, a sort of turning back on her mother tongue and then of course we, we come we come to realize later and we say well you know why is this the case and and then we realize it's actually to do 
with, also as I was saying, although it's not a forced exile because of external conditions, it's linked to the fact that she was abandoned by her mother when she was a child and her mother was English speaking. And so, she, so her mother was taken away from her and her English tongue, her mother tongue was taken away from her, you know, with her mother. And then she acquires a German mother, so a, a German stepmother, and acquires a new uh, t um, uh, language with German. And so in a sense, we then, her, her choice of her choice of the French language was almost like a kind of reaction she couldn't go back to the, to the mother tongue because that was dead that was gone there was no link uh, so French was was her choice it was her freedom to be able to const construct something new for herself and for her family um, but it was interesting this link about uh, the you know that the, 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 the mother the, the, the mother embodies the language and the culture and so it's all been taken away from her because her mother abandoned her um, and then, I've lost my um, and then something else that that we were told about, but it's not actually in the text, is in fact her her ambiguous attitude towards abandonment, and how in her in her in her novel writing, she actually um, doesn't really judge mothers who abandon who abandon their children, and is able to is able to write about it more freely, understanding the need of the mother to also see to her own personal needs. Uh, um, but in her biographical writing, how actually she she she's not forgiving of how her mother abandoned, and and her, how hard that was, and so that made us think about writing and how. So that's a link with something that was said earlier about how writing um, <coughs> is impossible without exile, which was given in the earlier presentation, and about writing being the nearest thing to freedom. Um, but also, whether, whether the exile is internal or external, exile always, e exile always equals suffering. So it's almost like she's saying, you know, um, but, yeah. Um, exactly. And so she's saying, in a sense, it... it, it doesn't matter what the reasons are. I mean, she's quite apologetic at the beginning that she doesn't have these traumatic reasons, but at the same time, distinguishing between the reasons for exile and its effects upon you. And so, for whatever reason you, you go into exile, you know, it always in, entails pain and suffering. Another important point that was made is that this is the text of a daughter and not so much of a mother. So, it's actually about a daughter looking back, and it, we do have about her motherhood at the end of the text when she herself becomes a mother, but much of it is actually about her experience and her choices, if you like, and how France, and it's also about her looking for a new mother and how France, in a sense, becomes, becomes her mother. Um, and, and Exactly, yeah. And so, the, um, and also we're interested in the, the imagery that she uses, you know, very strong biological imagery of breastfeeding for learning the language. Um, and so there were, so, um, And so, yeah, I've spoken about that. The conflicting drive then between the, the so, the, so then, so in a sense, she 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 condemns her own mother, but at the same time, she has the freedom through fiction to try and understand the more multi-dimensional roles of, of mother. But then, of course, we also questioned whether her initial statement about um, about the no this tension between the novelist, either you know, you're selfish if you're a novelist, and you're selfless, selfless if you're a mother. You know, we also agreed that in fact this is this is a bit of a, a myth, and it's an ideology, and in fact, um, you know, the idea of the self-sacrificing mother uh, is also something to, to be questioned. Um, but then it was also pointed out that. In her novels, because in her novels she actually does manage to reconcile and to understand, and in her novels you have various women, various children who are abandoned by their mothers, but they come out, come out okay in the end. It's as if through her literary writing she's able to say that actually it is okay. Um, um, we, we spoke about her relationship with feminism. And I think uh, her relationship with feminism and how and how this has changed and and this sort of led to a broader discussion really about feminism and, and motherhood and how how often how often it's only at the point of motherhood where biology kicks in and where feminism starts to become it starts to become more of a of a of an issue um, I don't know if I'm doing justice to uh, but anyway um, you can all add after um, 
Uh, so this question about motherhood, is motherhood in juxtaposition to feminism, is motherhood a part of feminism, what, you know, different understandings of feminism, um, and, and also uh, the, the idea of mothering and the biological mother, so, you know, this, 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 it was interesting that this author apparently has gone towards the idea of actually a certain biological determinism for mothering, which is, which is quite different to um, a, a sort of anthropological ways of seeing mothering, where it doesn't have to be the biological mother, and there's, you know, there's all kinds of different forms of mothering, allo-mothering, and um, so this also brought up um, concerns with <coughs> different concepts of freedom and what does freedom mean. And so this, this is kind of... Um, what? Oh, oh, sorry. No, just two more. Just for my last question, the, the, the other question that we felt that we were also answered was the number six. So the the six about what positive strategies. So we felt that this was a positive strategy. This this, this decision to to bring up her children in French and, and, and in, in increasing the the children's integration into France and seeing it as a. But I also thought it was curious that she doesn't. She plays down the multilingualism, which could also be a positive strategy. But in fact, um, and then number ten about the literary techniques. So this is what I said earlier in fact, but I just didn't point to the question. The, the, the way that she manages to reconcile in literature and what perhaps she hasn't able to reconcile in her own uh, biographical life. So anyway, anything that I've missed out or not said correctly then, <laughs> feel free to